This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. Pluto TV is playing the biggest movies every night this summer for free. Watch hit movies like The Matrix, G.I. Joe Retaliation, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Scary Movie, Runaway Bride, and more all summer long. Check out the biggest stars like The Rock, Keanu Reeves, Tom Cruise, Julia Roberts, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and more. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of free TV channels in English and Spanish featuring TV shows, news, sports, comedy, and more all for free. Download the free Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device, including Android and Apple smartphones. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free. Hey, it's Christine Blackburn, the creator and host of Storyworthy. Over the last 11 years, I've heard incredible true stories from some of the best comedians and talents in the world. So if you want to listen to comedians like Theo Vaughn talking about hunting squirrels with his father, or Burt Kreischer telling his famous story, The Machine, about being held up on a train in Russia. Or how about listening to Bobcat Goldthwait tell his story about performing with the Juggalos? Oh, and comedian Esther Koo. She has a cheating story that will blow your mind. I've also talked to big stars like Larry King, Sugar Ray Leonard, Wendy McClendon Covey, Kevin Nealon, Alonzo Bowden, and on and on. No matter where you start listening, enjoy Storyworthy. Listen to Storyworthy on Podcast One, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcast. I'm excited to sit down again with Heather Hying and Brett Weinstein. They're together this time. They're both James Madison Program Visiting Fellows at Princeton University. They have been invited to address Congress at the U.S. Department of Justice and Department of Education and have addressed audiences across the globe. They were professors at the Evergreen State College for 15 years until they resigned in the wake of of 2017 campus riots at Evergreen State College that focused in part on Weinstein and Hyang's opposition to a day of racial segregation and other college equity proposals. We're sitting down today to talk about their new book, A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. All right. I am with Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying, everyone. Everyone's very excited. You've both been on the podcast individually, but it's nice to have you together as a unit. Very excited to be here. Yeah, we are glad as always, both of us, to talk with you, Bridget. I know. I love our conversations, and so does my audience. They were very excited when I heard you guys were coming on. They were all posting in my locals community the book that many of them have purchased your book. Congratulations. It seems like it's doing very well, and people are eager to get their hands on it. Yeah. I tried we- to buy it on Amazon, but it was out of stock for the moment. We are we are thrilled at how well it's doing and how well it's being received. Yes, that's a good sign. Not so thrilled that it's uh, out of stock. Although obviously we can't be too disappointed at that either. But uh, those who have not gotten a copy of the book, we should say Wait. it is not out of stock everywhere. So it is okay. it is findable if uh, one is a little diligent. Oh yeah, I think bookshop dot org is a good resource. You they will fulfill your order from a local bookshop. It's where I tell people to go in in lieu of Amazon. So they're everywhere, but they'll find the most local uh, bookstore that has your book. So that might be a good option for people. Great. And if you haven't read it yet uh, or bought it, I encourage people to wait and buy it because I did read it and it was amazing. I really think it's uh, so necessary right now in terms of where we are as a culture I like to try and talk, and you mentioned this in the book, I like to try and talk a lot about what we're kind of working towards and for instead of what we're against. And I feel like this book is really grounded in that. It seems like it was a long time coming. How how long have you been thinking about writing this book? Well, we've been thinking about the underlying toolkit that the book presents for a very long time. We have been talking about a book with this title and this scope for more than a decade, clearly. Mm -hmm. It is something our students asked us to do when we were teaching 
they they many of them had an experience of suddenly seeing themselves with much greater clarity looking through an evolutionary lens and many wanted to share this with friends who weren't in our classes and um so anyway finally we've uh, we've delivered it yeah it's it has the sense of a lot of hard earned knowledge and it definitely feels like a toolkit and some of it seems so obvious what are you hearing from people about what they're taking from this book just kind of normies not students people like me or people who have read it well let me start by saying that w what you said you clearly hesitated a little bit as if you might be disrespecting us possibly by saying <laughs> it seemed obvious but there's there's no disrespect there at all in fact there's a term that we a phrase that we used to use which is that uh so much in evolutionary biology is obvious in retrospect mm. and this is you know this is the hallmark of some really complex but fundamental ideas which is that you may not be positioned right you may not have the background yet you may just not have the the right place in time and space to see something, but when it is presented to you, it becomes clear and it it clarifies other things about how you interpret the world as well. So mm -hmm. that is, in fact, our part of our goal in presenting you know such a breadth of of ways that you can apply an evolutionary toolkit from you know what to eat and how to understand your own health through sex and relationships through being an adult and how to how to have a functioning society. In fact, the ultimate example of obvious in retrospect is natural selection itself, which took Darwin decades to finally uh, bring to the world and obviously a full book to explore the idea, but we can easily sum it up now in a few well-chosen sentences. And, you know, many who have thought about the idea have looked at it and said, well, of course, now that right. you mention it, once you've got heredity and you've got selection, how could anything else be true? It's really... I appreciate the time you took in the opening of the book, taking us back all the way back in the quick, brief overview of human evolution, because not just because it's fascinating, but also miraculous in some ways. I'm not really sure if you believe in miracles or not, <laughs> or what your sense of that is, but it just seems so there, like you say in the book, there are just it could have gone so many other ways and yet I guess it couldn't have. And it's fascinating to just realize where we are in that lineage. Yeah. Well, that's their yeah. place. Thank you for that. Um, we weren't, we felt that it was absolutely necessary. It's, it's chapter two and it really feels very different from every other chapter in the book. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it does this quick, deep, broad dive <laughs> into the last 3.5 billion years on Earth, right? You know, with, <laughs> yeah. with you know, a history from the origin of life on Earth through, through humans. And obviously, we have to skip a lot. And we have to go really, really fast. But for me, it felt, um, and you know, I think I speak for Brett here, it just felt absolutely necessary, both to, you know, to present a sense of scale and mm -hmm. perspective, and also, you know, that that deep dive, that origin of species level style of understanding, what we call macroevolution, where the macro is like the long time, is a really different kind of evolutionary toolkit than what we're using in most of the rest of the book, which is more microevolutionary, you know, how do individuals within populations come to become better fit for their environment? And so that really deep dive, which is probably what most people would think of, like, okay, now we're talking about dinosaurs. Now we're talking about the meteor that hit the Earth 65 million years ago, right? Like, that's what a lot of people have in their heads when you say, okay, I'm going to do evolution with you. Mm -hmm. But we try to do it differently, you know, with, you know, more fun. You know, we, we have divergences into lizards and birds and such. And it also just provides a kind of a framing for, okay, now that we're talking about health, remember that we're fish. Remember that we're mammals. And and yes, more recently, we're post-industrialists, uh, but all of those things are pieces of our history and none of them disappear. So let's deal with your, uh, your question about miracles, though, <laughs> because it's actually in some ways uh, kind of central to, to the book, which is we don't believe in miracles per se. That is to say, everything that we know about the universe suggests it's all explicable. Mm -hmm. However, the idea of miracle is a very important one. That is to say, it is shorthand for something which outstrips our ability to comprehend it presently. And that is very necessary. It's not only necessary for human beings historically, but it's necessary even within science. There are lots of places mm -hmm. where we can't explain the connection between one level of analysis and another. 
And we don't talk about miracles, but frankly, if you were to analyze the question of how it is that we are communicating abstract ideas to you by vibrating the air between us, <laughs> right? That's pretty darn miraculous. Mm -hmm. You could say the same thing if you were to look at a hummingbird uh, that navigates its world with, you know, this incredibly tiny brain connected to these sensors and uh, you know, we could go all day with things that basically are so remarkable that though we understand in some sense what process produced them, they come very close to being miracles. It reminds me a little bit, maybe I'm wrong, but of the, the you discuss this often in your book, the literally false but metaphorically true, where there there's a miracle is that thing that it might not literally be a miracle, but it, it feels like there's no other word for explaining. Even in that chapter two, when you really sit down and try and comprehend it, it is incomprehensible that I'm sitting here. <laughs> right. It, 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 uh, it is incomprehensible in some sense. And maybe what miracle means is at this moment, Given what we know, there's no percentage in your trying to sort out the explanation for this particular thing. Either you won't make progress or the cost for making that progress is too high. And so people have accepted a shorthand in lieu of the deeper explanation, which ultimately must be there, but is not accessible to them. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of, the other, one of the other things that we hope people take away from the book is an explicitly scientific and evolutionary understanding of who we are as humans doesn't take away any of the sense of awe mm -hmm. or joy or miraculousness, right? Or or beauty. And because this is this is one of the fairly common pushbacks by humanists against trying to understand everything that is human from a scientific perspective. And um, our view is quite the opposite. The more you know, the more beautiful and awe-inspiring we are. And um, this is this is an attempt to reveal some of that. Yeah, it's actually a, an extension of Feynman's point that you know, he was challenged by a friend about you scientists are always, you know, taking apart things and you'll, you know, you'll ruin a beautiful flower trying to figure out how it functions. And Feynman's point was, look, I've got access to the beauty of the flower just as you do, but I also have access to a deeper level of beauty that mm. one needs a scientific toolkit to see. And so this, our book really is in some sense about what you see if you look at us with a, an evolutionary sophistication, which frankly, as you, you know, you imply, once you've seen it, it makes things much more intuitive, right? It's, it's not like it's so complex that you have to take our word for it. We present the mechanism for looking at us as products of evolution. And when, once you get the, the theme, you can extrapolate to things that we don't talk about in the book. I was thinking a lot reading the book and You've obviously spent a lot of time in the Amazon and Ecuador, and and it reminded me, and there was that great quote from, I believe he was a former student, where he said, walking into your class feels like a, what is the exact quote, feels like entering an ancestral state, something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm, that was always there that I didn't know I had access to or something. It was so beautiful, beautifully said, and that's how I felt reading your book. And oh. it reminded me of times when I've had the benefit of, I was in the bush in Australia. And when you were describing that transition from the night, the day to the night and the way the frogs would start, it was the same process that occurred. And it was, I still think of that sound every single day of my life, I think of just how I lived for it. It was something that just got in my soul. And I was, I wrote a piece about being on this ashram and how at first it's so jarring. And then the way that you live on the ashram starts to feel so ancestral is the right word. There's something so natural about it using pretty much eating mostly plant-based while we were, I think, totally plant-based, being very conscious about water, using all of our food waste to go back into the garden and the compost and having, we had the compostable toilets and we didn't have hot water. We had to wake up and build 
a fire out of wood to even make coffee or oatmeal. And it was, you had to get up at five and working very early in the day and having the afternoons and the rhythm, you start to just get into those natural rhythms and very low light pollution, very just natural noise and the rain on the tin roofs. And so there was a lot that your book triggered in my memory. And I, I feel so grateful to have had that And it was jarring coming out of it as well. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. We've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, a podcast you should definitely check out since you're a fan of high-quality, fascinating podcasts hosted by interesting people like yours truly. Two recent guests that Jordan interviewed that I think my audience would really appreciate are Brian Chesky, he's the co-founder and CEO of Airbnb, and they talk about surviving the pandemic. They lost 80% of its business during the first eight weeks, and now it's thriving, and why a company that still conducts itself like a startup is better poised to withstand and grow from business crises. He also had Charles Duhigg on. Charles is a Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter at the New York Times and author of Smarter, Faster, Better, The Secrets to Being Productive in Life and Business. And they talk all about learning more about the science of motivation and what makes us tick. We spend a lot of time talking about motivation and productivity on our podcasts and check-ins, and I know a lot of my listeners would love this. So search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. My question is, how do we, and I think your book really does a great job of addressing this, how do we access that in our modern life? Yeah. Great question. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking as you were talking was, I, you know, I too, Brett too, we too have had those experiences that have gone on for months, but not in a while at this point. You know, mm-hmm. life, life, including the amazing things in life, in our cases, you know, careers and children stop you from going and spending months at a time in places that are wholly unlike the, the place that you would normally call home. But finding a way to get out of the all the modernity, at least briefly, but completely, is extraordinarily renewing. And it does bring you back, you know, this is not a call to traditionalism. It's not regressive. It's not conservatism, right? This is us trying to understand what of what we've been is actually valuable and wonderful and needs to be renewed, and what kinds of progress we can and should be trying to make um, to find our way to a future that that is better for everyone. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, when, when we were professors, for instance, we would do at least every quarter a four or five day field trip with our students and often more. And sometimes we did these extended study abroad trips. And we tried to choose, and this, you know, this got more and more difficult as it got later in time, but we tried to choose places that had no cell service and had no internet. So that while we were there, we were simply there with one another. And we're there with one another, and when the sun set, you know, yes, we had electricity and we had running water at these at these at these field sites, at least in domestically. But it meant that when at the end of the day, when all of the curricular stuff for the day was done, we could sit around the campfire and just be with one another. Mm-hmm. And um, that was that that is valuable and worth seeking, at least occasionally. Yeah, and it also, to your point reveal certain things about what we are and how we work. So uh, we used to run certain kinds of experiments, um, you know, not formal experiments, but one thing, there was a, a place we used to go called Dry Falls in Eastern Washington. It's a beautiful natural habitat that is, uh, the way it is allows you to navigate without a trail um, mm. because there's a, it's like high canyon so you can see where you are. but. Uh, we would encourage our students to walk there at night without headlamps. The instinct Mm -hmm. as a modern person is turn on your headlamp and see where you're going, right? Turn off your headlamp. And then, you know, you're immediately blind. And then five minutes later, you're not blind. And then you realize actually moonlight is sufficient to navigate even in a place like this. And so that, you know, it brings you back to a state that obviously would have been commonplace for our ancestors. We also would run an experiment. We did this uh, in Ecuador, also domestically, but we would have a day in which people were, people sometimes called it silent day, but it was anything but silent. But you were not allowed to use language, right? So 
you would go through the day without speaking. Produce or consume, right? right. You weren't supposed to read weren't either. You weren't supposed to read. Oh, and wow. The, and the thing is, it affects people very differently. But nonetheless, it does reveal something about the role that language is playing in your life that you just, you know, you can go a whole lifetime without thinking carefully about that question. Um, so anyway, these these are all mechanisms for allowing you to tune back into some other aspect of yourself. And they're they're all quite worthwhile. I guess the last thing I'd say on that point is many years ago, I don't remember how many, but I was listening to an interview by these parkour experts, British mm -hmm. ones, uh, mm -hmm. called Three Run. That was the name of their group. And they were talking to each other about where parkour comes from. And parkour is obviously something quite new, right? You know, you're using an urban landscape to bounce back and forth and do things that are impressive and interesting. But what they said about what they were doing was tapping into the deep monkey stuff. <laughs> well, and you can see it when you watch them do it. You're like, oh, I get it. This is a person who has a really good grasp on their center of gravity, and it allows them to bounce around the world the way a skier bounces off the tops of moguls or something like that. And it, you know, increasingly we need to think in this way, right? Mm -hmm. You're a human being. You have capabilities you don't even know you have. Mm -hmm. And just even figuring out what they might be and how to operate them is kind of an interesting puzzle. That's yeah. really funny. I, Monkey, I, monkeys with wheels. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> monkeys with wheels. <laughs> I was climbing a tree in Santa Cruz. It was called Tree Nine, and it was on the campus. And it was this like famous tree that apparently everybody climbed. And my cousin kind of shamed shamed me into climbing it or dared me into it. And I didn't. I'm not a huge fan of heights, although I've kind of pushed myself beyond that. And after the first third, you're probably dead if you fall. But I, my mantra the entire time was, I am descended from monkeys. I am descended <laughs> from monkeys. That was just my mantra the whole way up the tree. I'm like, I'm descended from monkeys. I've got this. It's totally, I'm going to be okay. And it got me up to the top. And there were all these little trinkets. And it was really amazing. It was one of those things I pushed myself to do. And I'm so glad I di did it. You got to be really careful when you're doing that, that it doesn't subtly occur to you that you're a fish. <laughs> I'm also a fish. I'm I freak also, out. Yeah, it's just not the moment. There are other moments on the couch is where you want to think about the fact that you're a fish. That's really true and hilarious. You talk about um, hyper novelty. Can you explain that, that concept and how it relates to the book? Sure. Hyper novelty. So, we should say, as, as you know from reading it, that human beings are a very special product of evolution. Our species is different than others. And one of the primary differences we point to is that we are adapted for change. And the mm -hmm. way this manifests is that we don't have a niche the way other species do. What we do is we switch between niches. That's our special trick. Um, and so we are better at, at dealing with change than other creatures by a fair piece. But when the rate of change gets sufficiently fast, what it means is that we are always out of our depth. We are never in an environment to which we are well adapted, which causes us to be sick physically, psychologically, socially, societally. And so that's really the hyper novelty state. It's a state at which the rate of change is too fast, even for a creature that's as good at adapting as we are. Yeah. Have, have there been past instances of this in our history? Well, we are changing the rate of change itself mm. so fast now that we are, this is new. Yes, mm. there have been moments before where the rate of change has been very fast. It's not simply been on the ascent the whole time. But, um, you know, you, you could measure it from a number of moments. Um, but even just looking at things like population on the planet or technological development or measures like GDP, it seems like, you know, the, the Industrial Revolution begins a moment after which no one really was born into the world that their parents were born into. Mm. And increasingly, you're not even born into the world that your siblings were born into. Mm -hmm. I right? see that with my nephews. Yeah, I would say it is not without precedent. Things like the invention of the printing press changed the way human beings function, but that the difference in degree between the rate of change that we're seeing and those revolutions that have transformed the way human beings have functioned in the past is so great that in some sense, there's no comparison. 
You know, right. it's, it's a little bit like if we were to say, you know, are human beings, you know, the only creatures that communicate linguistically? And then we could come up with, you know, 10 or 12 species that do something in the neighborhood. But the point is, even if we take the most extreme examples of creatures that communicate vocally with each other, none of them have a grammar that allows them to transmit an abstract idea. So effectively, even if there are, you know, hints about what could what could be communicated this way, we, there, we are alone and we moderns are alone in facing a rate of change that no ancestor uh, would have understood. Mm, it feels exponential. It feels yeah. like that that graph is just going straight up. <laughs> and I do wonder how to slow it down. I always I kind of always joke like the the next generation that knows what it's like to be without electricity or have to fend for themselves is going to be after a massive collapse. And not that I am, am hoping for that, but it it I don't see any way out of this other than some kind of massive collapse. Are you hopeful knowing what you know? Some days. Um, I mean, it, <laughs> it, I would I, oh, go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, it depends what you mean by hopeful. I think the thing that is hopeful is that I believe at least some of us are beginning to have the conversations necessary to get ourselves out of the predicament that we're in. This book is an invitation to such a discussion. The last chapter of the book is specifically about that topic. Um, on the other hand, it does seem like there's an awful lot of inertia holding us to our trajectory, and that's very frightening. Mm -hmm. But I guess the the final thing to say, or at least for me, is in evolution, we have a metaphor that we use to speed up communication between people who, who know it. It's called the adaptive landscape. And essentially opportunities are peaks. They're described as peaks and the obstacles to moving from one opportunity to another are valleys. And adaptive valleys are very dangerous, dark places, but you have to go through them to go from one state to a better state. So mm. I guess the point is things look very dark, Mm -hmm. But that doesn't really tell us where we are because they have to look dark. They look dark whether or not we're about to do ourselves in or we're about to discover what we become next. And both things are, as far as we know, still on the table as possibilities. Mm. And one of the ways uh, I would say that we can work towards avoiding collapse is to, you know, you, you say you think it's going to be the generation after collapse that relearns if they can how to do things uh, like make fire and grow food and such, <laughs> and you know, and and we we are in part, and this is only a small part of what we're advocating for, but that modern people pre-collapse in order to do what they can to avoid collapse should learn how to do things in the physical world and mm -hmm. learn how to do things in the physical world that are of nature so that they can remember some of that ancestral state and pull out of this hyper novel, you know, borderline postmodern environment um, that is really making chaos of us all. Yeah. The first thing that we advise people who are worried about collapse is to invest in tools rather than knowledge. And the second thing is hoard peanut butter. <laughs> true, true. Do you mean literal <laughs> tools rather than knowledge? Well, a little of both. You know, the okay. fact is a small number of tools that you're good at wielding uh, tremendously reduce the hazard to, to people of being caught off guard. Um, but mostly what we mean is cognitive tools. You know, mm -hmm. some of those cognitive tools involve knowledge about how you would use physical tools. Well, and some of the, the interface between the two, sorry to interrupt, but is, you know, having the human connections so that each individual little family unit doesn't have to have all the tools, that there are right. connections between people, affiliations, bonds, wherein you can have, you know, collectively the tools that you need. And, this, you know, this is one of the wonders of, of humans, which we talk about, I think, I think right up front, actually, is that we are this incredibly generalist species that mm -hmm. is largely made up of specialists. And, you know, we also, we need individuals who are generalists. And the more generalist we can be, the more able we are to move between domains and actually problem solve across across scopes that we might not have been able to imagine before. Um, but you can't imagine, you know, even a human being in 1800, but certainly one in the 21st century, can't do everything, right? We can't, right. you know, no human being can do everything they want to do uh, for themselves to sustain their own lives and to be the most productive they can be. And so, you know, we need other human beings and there's nothing wrong with that. 
We should, you know, mm-hmm. we should recognize that this is one of the things about being human that has always been true and is not going to change. And that's actually okay. We are happy to welcome a new sponsor to the show. I'm talking about sheath underwear. Have you or your guy friends had trouble finding comfortable underwear? Underwear that is focused on your comfort with no chafing, no sticking, no drama, and designed so that everything fits exactly where it should, if you know what I mean? If yes, then you have to try sheath underwear. It all starts with sheath's dual pouch system, a concept that was developed by the company's founder after enduring a summer in Iraq. Day after day of triple digit heat and unbearable chafing and discomfort. Founder and CEO Robert Patton felt there had to be a better way, and now there is. The dual pouch comfortably cradles you, just like a hammock for your family jewels. And don't forget to check out their newest additions like the Bamboo 5 and the Mesh Boxer Brief. My husband is obsessed with these. He swears by them. They're the only underwear that he wears anymore. And sheath underwear is all about supporting shows like ours and supporting free speech. So make sure to give sheath underwear a try. Go to sheathunderwear.com now and use the promo code WALKIN to receive 20% off today. That's sheathunderwear.com and use the promo code W-A-L-K-I-N for 20% off. I really, there's so much, you guys cover so much ground in the book. It's actually amazing how much ground you cover because like you say, at one point in your book, every one of those chapters could be their own book and probably should be. The part about food and sleep I thought was really important. And again, something that seems so basic and we're, we've lost we've lost touch with this. I mean, I, I fly around America and I'm like, Oh my God. And after the pandemic, the numbers coming out about childhood obesity and adult obesity, it is, this is not good. What are your thoughts on how we can try and incentivize maybe better, better choices? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's it's extraordinary how unhealthy we are, mm-hmm. and and to to what degree we can attribute that to quick market driven fixes that appeal to our short term appetites, um, like an appetite for sugar or fat or dopamine, you know, what, whatever it is. You know, we ask we begin the food chapter, I believe, uh, by asking, "Is there a best diet for humans?" Because mm-hmm. that seems to be that certainly is a question that people assume the answer to is yes, and uh, the answer being yes seems to be an assumption of so much of uh, instructions about how to eat. And we argue there can't be, there can't possibly be. And that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of bad diets for humans. There's a lot of stuff we shouldn't be eating. To borrow from Michael Pollan, most of what you find in the middle of the grocery store as opposed to around the perimeter is probably not very good for you. You know, the the more shelf stable it is, the more likely it is to do some harm to you, whether or not we currently know what those harms might be. Mm -hmm. Um, And in fact, with regard to shelf stability, we do know what some of the harms are. But is, for instance, a paleo diet healthy? Probably. Is it the Mm -hmm. best diet for all humans? No chance, because mm-hmm. think about the people who were, you know, who were eating a Mediterranean diet for many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. If you tell them that what they should be doing is something that harkens back to a, uh, you know, a time on the African savanna, that imagines that there hasn't been a whole lot of human evolution since then. And that, in fact, is is one of the messages of the book. That yes, it's called a hunter gatherer's guide to the twenty first century because uh, when you say human evolution to people, a lot of what you'll imagine is you know bands, small bands of humans on the African savanna, right? Maybe right. fighting lions or something. <laughs> uh, and that's that's true. You know, we were there was a moment when all humans were doing that, or in coastal Africa, but. There are all these other moments of our history that are also true. So for ten to twelve thousand years almost all humans have been agriculturalists, which means we're also adapted to a farming lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And for 150, 70-ish years, uh, most of us have been post-industrialists. And we're less and less well-adapted the newer the thing is. Um, So, you know, high sugar, especially highly refined from bits and pieces of plants as opposed to eating whole foods, it's going to be a very long time, if ever, before we get adapted to that. Mm -hmm. So I would add one thing, which is, Evolutionary toolkit wise, there's a hidden dimension here, and uh, we think it's obvious in retrospect, but 
you've got, if you stand on the street corner and you watch people walk by, you see a lot of obesity. The chances that that is bad genes that have caused human beings to eat too much is roughly zero. Right. We know that part of the problem is that we are not wired to stop eating things that would have been very limited for our ancestors, right? There's no mm -hmm. off switch for our desire for things like sugar because you didn't need one. Sugar is pretty rare. You know, if a plant puts uh, flesh on a fruit, you can pretty much afford to eat it. Whereas we have sugar sitting on the table in the diner, you know? Right. Um, but if you step back a little bit, you can also say, well, if it isn't our genes, then it's something developmental, right? If it's our encounter with too much sugar or other such things, then that's something we have power over. And we may not be able to do very much for people who have already picked up the developmental patterns that cause this, but we haven't yet screwed up the people who aren't here yet, right? Mm. And so to focus on what do you do about obesity, well, those that's two, two different questions. One thing is we should figure out what we can about what to do for people who've picked up the bad patterns. But the thing that we should most focus on is how do we not do this to more people, right? Mm. How can we fix the developmental environment so that it doesn't cause harm to another generation? Because if what we focus on is how do you fix fat people, then we're going to continue to make more of them and our fixes are going to be inadequate. Whereas we can stop making them and do it what we can for those who are already here. But if we stop making them, the problem is a tiny fraction of what it is otherwise. And how do you do that without, you know, banning McDonald's and <laughs> and regulating the junk food industry? And how well, well, we're not fans of a nanny state approach, mm -hmm. but at some level, you don't really want a system where people profit from externalizing harm onto others. And, mm -hmm. you know, nowhere is this more clear than the harm that corporations do to those who can't defend themselves from things like advertising. And so mm -hmm. really we have to recognize that the most fundamental right we have might be the right to insulate our children from the perverse economic incentives that will cause others to parasitize them. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think you know there are a lot of people who have not just learned to um, eat nutritiously, but to actually feel that the food that they're eating that is good for them is delicious. This is something that people can do. And it involves a physiological transformation at the gut microbiome level, right? So you know, we can move from desiring junk food to desiring real food. Mm -hmm. And you know, we you know, we we apply this kind of rubric to lots of things in the book, junk food, junk sex, junk media, junk politics, right? Like we can actually train ourselves to crave the long-term rewards by actually enjoying the in-the-moment experience as well. Um, and that becomes a better reward than the short-term dopamine hit or sugar hit or caffeine hit or whatever it is. Um, I probably shouldn't have added caffeine because actually there's very little evidence that coffee is bad for you and it's probably good for you. Mm. Um, but, you know, caffeine in a distilled form in the form of Red Bull, yeah, that is, you know, that, right. that is toxic. <laughs> um, but, you know, caffeine, if you're getting it from your tea or your chocolate or your coffee, you know, it's, it's actually fine you know, within, within moderation. So, you know, we can... With regard to children, monkey see, monkey do, right? right. And uh, it's it's very strange to hear advice to parents that sounds like encourage your child to do X rather than say do X and your child will do it too. Mm -hmm. You know, go to the farmer's market with your child if if you have the ability, but come home arms laden with with leafy greens that you think are delicious and you eat them right out of the basket and they will too because mm -hmm. they will see the pleasure that you take in it and they will learn to take that pleasure in it as well. And that's not to say that a basket of French fries isn't always going to be appealing, <laughs> um, right? Uh, but th you know, there are there are things that you can do by exposing children to actually delicious food that makes a lot of what is actually available in the center of the grocery store or at the fast food outlets really unappealing. Mm. So it's not only the type of food though. There's also something to be said, and we talk in the book quite a bit about the precautionary principle. The fact is we've got an epidemic of obesity that afflicts some people and not others. We don't know what the parameters are that cause it, but what that does is not suggest that you should throw up your hands. 
but that you should exclude those novel things that are on a list of candidates, right? So what is the result of the emulsifiers that are used to make highly processed food when ingested by a person? Mm -hmm. We don't know. We certainly don't know fully. Probably a good idea to exclude those emulsifiers. What is the result of the residual pesticides that are on vegetables grown in a, uh, a uh, highly mechanized modern way we don't fully know you know could it be parkinson's disease there's some indication so in any case the point is you can make a lot of fun of people who eat organic right they're paying more mm -hmm. for food that mm -hmm. isn't any more nutritious on the other hand the number of possible candidates for causes of ill health that they are excluding is many and they you know i, I will say our kids are terrifically healthy they have had really high quality food, largely prepared at home, but we've also made the decision to buy organic because we don't know what all of these inputs mm. do, and it is certainly not unsafe to exclude them. And, mm. and I guess one of the other, one of the things that people don't as often talk about with regard to what a potential benefit of, for instance, buying organic might be, is that organic produce is likely to, this is not going to sound like a positive at first, but it's likely to rot faster. Mm, right. Yeah. And um, traditionally, uh, and you know, no, right, rather conventionally grown produce. And what that means is that if you're buying from a market, say, as a, you know, the, a farmer's market, you know, is pretty close. You know, your supply chain is very short. But if you're mm. buying conventional versus organic produce at a market, uh, you can be assured that the organic produce had a somewhat short supply chain that it couldn't have spent a tremendous amount of time in transit because it wouldn't have lasted. Mm. And that means, you know, we do know, for instance, that whole food decays in nutritional value as it ages. And mm -hmm. so, the, you know, the fresher your food is, the better it is for you. So there, it, or, organic is one of these things that is, as Brett said, you know, easy to mock. It's, of course, been captured by, you know, the government regulatory apparatus in a way that isn't always serving either the farmers or the consumers. Um, but does it have benefits beyond what we can yet quantify? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm sure of it. It seems problematic that it's more expensive to eat healthy. This is something that People talk a lot about food deserts and where, it, and these are real problems. And I have no idea how to address them, but that does seem like you said it's more expensive. That's not really not everybody can afford to eat organic, and that that seems like it doesn't seem like there is any kind of incentive to eat well <laughs> at all, other than just the kind of health movement or. I was reading the book, um, How Not to Die, and it's all about just like plant-based whatever. And in it, he was talking about how in order, I guess, to, to be considered very active in America, and this was written back in like 2015, so I'm not sure what the numbers are now. It means walking 20 minutes. <laughs> That's, That's right. considered very active. Yeah. 20 <laughs> like, minutes a day. Yeah, it's 20 insane. 20 minutes a day. Yep. It's crazy, uh, and, you know. Especially, you know, walking is a very special evolutionary skill, right? Bipedally, at least, and uh, it's something our ancestors would have done a tremendous amount about, mm -hmm. uh, a tremendous amount of. And so, yes, the idea that we have not restored walking as a central part, you know, really, in some ways, I, I, I must say, I find the design of cities quite upsetting. Mm -hmm. The way they were completely you know in the east it's a little different because many of the at least central cities were uh, pre-automobile but so much of our modern landscape is designed around the automobile and how much more pleasant it would it be and how much more walking would people do if these things were set up to exclude the cars from the center right cars are necessary to get across long distances but if you know if you weren't obstructed by roads and needing to use crosswalks and all of these things just to walk through an urban landscape, I think people would do a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, it's definitely, that was shocking to me because that means a lot of people aren't walking at all. If the average is 20 minutes a day and that seems like not a good thing. I, I just... I, I'm not sure because we know we know these things. We know the things we need to do. 
And this is one of the questions I've always had. And I've had this question about addiction. I have it about suicide. I have it about eating bad food. I have it about spending too much time on Twitter. I always used to joke, which is a really dark joke. And I apologize for anyone who's going to get mad at me. But I always just say my suicide note would be take that, Darwin. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good one. Uh, thank you. Because it doesn't make sense. I'm like, you don't see squirrels like hanging from trees. I don't. It seems to go so much against the animal instinct to survive. And so, as, as well as eating junk food, as well as I, I'm in recovery. So addiction was very, it's something you guys kind of brush over, but it's something very fascinating to me. And from this kind of lens of hyper novelty and and just, I, I, I really do think genetically I'm actually prone to addiction coming from like long lines of Irish alcoholics. But yeah, it just, it still seems like I don't understand the impulse to self-destruct. Well, we don't uh, go deeply into this in the book, but I wouldn't leap to the conclusion that this is anti-evolutionary. I think this is one of these things that we think is anti-evolutionary because in its modern form, it clearly is. Mm -hmm. But the fact is our field has not done a good job of understanding what we are. It has overly focused on individuals and overly focused on individual fitness. And in a context of lineages, there is um, a lot to be said about how self-destruction under certain circumstances is actually part of lineage well-being. Mm. Well, that's a fascinating theory. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hypothesis. It can't <laughs> it's a be a theory. And, <laughs> hypothesis. <right. laughs> wow. Yeah. It just, I've never, I think I spend a, a probably an inordinate amount of time thinking about these things. And I was thinking a lot about it reading your book because, like I said, some of this stuff seems obvious. And yet, why is it so hard to do? Sleep is another one that you guys talk in great detail about. And I, I don't think we really understand truly how important sleep is and how probably lacking most of us are in modern society. And how disruptive our modern landscape is, mm. right? The we have we have been lucky to be in situations for the last couple of decades where we could sleep in rooms that are very dark and very quiet, and many people don't have landscapes like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but whenever we travel, and you know, we're either in a hotel room or an Airbnb, uh, the number of, for instance, blue LEDs that are just just on in a room yeah. blazing at you is extraordinary and you know we this is something we've been talking about for you know well over a decade but at this point increasingly people recognize that blue spectrum light at night is disruptive of sleep Mm-hmm. And yet, we continue to have devices in our bedrooms on which it's actually impossible to turn off the blue light without turning off the device. You know, I, I've started carrying electrical tape around with me so that I can block out the light <laughs> and it's reversible, um, which is a, an absurd kludge for a fix. You know, obviously, mm-hmm. we have the technological capacity to not have those lights on, uh, impairing human health. Because, yes, sleep, you know, we argue in the book that we're aliens to be uh, clever enough to have gotten to this planet, to have landed here, they would actually not be surprised to find us spending a third of our lives in this in this apparently dormant state because surely mm-hmm. they would sleep too. So much of this conversation too, as, it, as we're having it and I'm thinking about it and I was reading about it, it's, it's a luxury to eat well. It's a luxury to live in a place where, you, where there isn't a lot of noise pollution. There definitely feels like a class element to being able to live a healthy life. Oh, this is, this is the essence of privilege. And, you know, the funny thing about it though, is evolutionarily speaking, when you first get such a privilege, you are grateful for it, but it so easily becomes normal that you stop noticing it. And I I don't think we explore it deeply in, in the book, but the, resurrection of our awareness of the privileges that we have and the sense of gratitude that one should have for things that are just baseline uh it it's it's really important and um 
Well, and this, and this fits with the idea of um, as evolved beings, we, like everything else on the planet, uh, seeks growth. Mm-hmm. And growth is, you know, feels good. But at this point, there's too many of us and we're using too much stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, we cannot afford to continue growing as a, as a species um, because we're putting everyone and, you know, all of us at risk. So how is it that we can produce a sense of growth, a sense of we're now getting more, we're now getting more fulfilled without actually using the resources um, that have been in the past used as part of the sense of growth? Mm, I loved that part of the book. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. I recently received my Helix mattress. It was the Midnight Lux Medium. Helix has a quiz that just takes two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Just go to helixsleep.com slash walk-in, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. Sleep is incredibly important to me, and now that I'm married, It has become a little bit of a challenge until we got the Helix mattress, which has probably saved our marriage. There's so much space. It's so comfortable. I love that it doesn't transfer motion. So he can toss and turn or I can toss and turn and it doesn't we don't wake each other up when I'm getting up and down to go to the bathroom or I have insomnia. They have a 10 year warranty and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it. But you will. I promise you will. Helix even has financing options and flexible payment plans, so a great night's sleep is never far away. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash walk-in. It's so complicated because you don't want to flatten everything to just being about justice, for example, but it really did get me thinking about, Yes, the poor do generally suffer the most from environmental pollution and from living in food deserts and not having access to healthy organic food or good schools and education. And how do you offer? First of all, I think it starts with yourself, obviously. You know, you have to live the, these practice, these principles on your own. But how do you? How do we even begin to offer it in places where they're not privileged? They're just not, they're, they're underprivileged. This is one of these puzzles that is either unsolvable or readily solved, depending upon how you approach it. Mm. And, you know, what we talk about in the last chapter of the book is we call it the fourth frontier, which is a system that will have to be developed. We don't even know how to blueprint it from here. It's inconceivable that we could, but we can describe what objectives it should be built to address. And I think the short answer to your question is, if you try to solve the problem you have just named in isolation uh, from the system that creates that problem, you will not only not succeed, but your solutions will have unintended consequences that will themselves need solutions. If on the other hand, you recognize that what we effectively need to do is do this very human thing and bootstrap a new way of being as every population that we come from has done many, many times in the past, that this is an, in some ways an unprecedented version of the problem because we're all in it together this time. We are all connected and we have to find that next way as effectively one human population. But the basic process is known and it's time, right? We can see the writing on the wall and what you're describing as a problem to solve is really a symptom of the fact that this system has now grown to the point that it has become unstable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, Frankly, I wouldn't spend a ton of time trying to figure out how to address that problem. What we need to do is address the underlying condition that causes problems like that so that three generations from now, the, uh, the idea of that kind of privation is a, uh, you know, a historical fact. Mm, Interesting. This kind of brings me to this idea of first principles. Can you, you mention this a lot in the book. Can you, elaborate on exactly what that means and how we can apply that to our lives and problems? Sure. And, you know, I think in some ways we were just talking about a version of it, which is Mm -hmm. probably why you you bring it up. But if you imagine 
scientifically speaking, most of us who are schooled in this this uh, manner of confronting questions imagine that all levels of analysis from the most fundamental particles up to the highest levels of emergence that we see in biology, they're all connected together in a way that we imagine is seamless. Mm. That is to say, there ought to be no level that couldn't in principle be explained by the level beneath it. That said, what we know currently involves huge gaps, right? It's, you know, not only do we not have the practical capacity to explain thought in terms of the underlying chemistry, but we don't even have the explanatory power to do it. We don't know what a thought is. Ultimately, we will, mm -hmm. if we last long enough. But the <laughs> point is, fundamental thinking is to say you go to the bottom layer of the gap of the piece of understanding that you're in and you work upwards towards an explanation rather than starting with the observation of the complex phenomenon in question and observing certain facts about it in isolation. And so for us, first principles aren't at the level of fundamental particles. For a physicist, they might be. For us, the fundamental level is the Darwinian level, right? And you take the very basics of Darwinism and you say, well, what are organisms built to do? How are they built to do it? And what does that imply about the way they should be structured and the way they should behave? And then imagine that you are such an organism. And what's more, you're such an organism with a twist where the gene layer has offloaded a bunch of the uh, hereditary apparatus to a cultural layer, right? That's not mm -hmm. true if you're an oak tree, but it's very true for people and it has implications. It alters the Darwinism. So fundamental thinking is really starting at a lower level and moving up rather than starting at the level of the complexity you're interested in and just observing stuff. So I would add that one of the ways to think about it is if you are uh, trying to explain, say, how people are interacting with one another, and you're using words that uh, you and someone else might disagree as to the precise meaning, you definitely aren't dealing with first principles. So, uh, you know, in animal behavior and also in human behavior, uh, we might talk a lot about territoriality. And I might say, man, you know, she's acting really territorial. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, what what is the definition of territorial that we are we are working with here? How do we partition that into its pieces and try to make the observation without the interpretation? So first principles thinking is uh, is you know, one of its manifestations uh, at sort of the empirical levels, an attempt to say, OK, I'm going to I'm going to watch, I'm going to observe and I'm going to try to figure out what I think it means. And that hypothesis then is going to be testable, but I'm not going to use terms, concepts that themselves are so wrapped up with assumptions uh, that I won't know if I've learned anything. So it, mm -hmm. it's an attempt to reduce assumptions, uh, to reduce jargon, um, to get back to things that can be observed at their most basic, and from there we can build up meaning. So we actually propose some first principles in this book, and the idea being if they're true and you proceed from them, they simplify the process of understanding humans in this case, rather than make it more complex. So the, the most important one is that our field has long understood that culture evolves. Dawkins proposed this in 1976 with the concept of memes and mimetic evolution. But what never got resolved was what is the relationship between the evolution of culture and the evolution of genes. And we propose an exact description, a precise description of that relationship, which we call the Omega Principle, which argues that for logical reasons that are simple to understand, culture is obligated to serve the genes. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean every instance of culture, but anything long-standing, expensive, and complex has to serve the underlying genes or the genes wouldn't put up with it. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that when you run into a behavior of humans, if it does pass that test, if you're looking at something long-standing, complex, and persistent, I mean, uh, complex, long-standing, and expensive, then you can infer that it is the genetic interests that are being served whether the genes have anything to say about that behavior or not. So that means we can look out at human history and find those patterns and not say, well, you know, is that biology or is that culture? Our point is actually 
culture is equally biological as genes. You can say, is it genetic or culture? That is a question about where the information is transmitted, but not what it's for, right? Mm -hmm. So that simplifies the understanding of humans radically, and we think um, quite productively. Okay. Can you give an example, uh, just maybe modern example or... Well, you can't give a modern example because things that are truly modern haven't passed the test of time. So we don't right. know whether they serve the underlying genes. But well, but but there are still things that we do, like marriage, mm -hmm. um, like war. Okay, mm -hmm. let's just take those two, right? Because okay. that that provides a, a those two examples. Um, <clears throat> most people believe that marriage is a good thing, whether or not mm -hmm. they're themselves in good marriages or want to be in marriage. Um, and most people understand that war is awful whether or not they imagine it to be necessary in some cases or not, but that it's awful. So to say that marriage is um, a cultural thing that is evolutionary, and to say that war is effectively a cultural thing that is evolutionary, is to make moral no moral judgment about either of them. Mm -hmm. So when we are making claims about things being evolutionary, we are not saying, therefore, it's good, and we are also not saying, therefore, it's inevitable. Because so much, you know, there are some things that don't change, right? You know, women are going to be the ones who get pregnant and lactate if someone is going to within a straight couple. Okay? You're, you're canceled. <laughs> right. No, I, I, I'm relieved. <laughs> That's, yeah, he's I relieved. Um, but, but so much is. So much is labile. Mm -hmm. So absolutely to recognize that war is an evolutionary strategy, that rape is an evolutionary strategy, that is mm. actually empowering because then we can say, okay, let us understand it so well that we can change the conditions so that we can minimize it happening from mm -hmm. here forward. It is to say that it's evolutionary is not to say, and therefore we embrace it. Of course right. not. But there are plenty of things that are evolutionary, like uh, a stranger's care for another person on the street when they fall, or a mother's love for her child. These are also evolutionary, and they are good, and we should be making rules in society to encourage that sort of behavior. Mm. So two more points. One, to say that something like rape or war is, or these, that these are evolutionary patterns is clearly true, but it is also true that the structures that prevent these things are evolutionary patterns. And so mm. it is important to get over the idea that there is like an, there is an adaptive state, right? You know, is a, is a fly more adaptive than an elephant? Not a good question. They're both <laughs> adaptive states. They solve slightly different versions of the same puzzle. Um, but you know, the, the big payoff of thinking in this way is something like religion, right? Our, our field has too long dismissed religion as a, a sort of error of thought and behavior. It is clearly mm. not an error of thought and behavior any more than a wing is an error of parts, right? And a wing serves a function. These belief systems serve a function. What is that function? We can talk about the specifics, and they will vary between religious traditions, but the basic problem they solve is one of persisting through time, which is what all evolutionary structures do, mm -hmm. right? So they are adaptations, and having clarity about that then tells us what sort of puzzle we still have to solve, right? What are the details about how this interacts with our history? What is the meaning going forward of these traditions that are adapted to a past environment that may or may not be adapted to our present environment? Those are the good questions, not what is this religious stuff for? Is it a mind virus? No, it's not a mind virus. That was <laughs> always a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating. I, I just feel like my brain always explodes when I talk to you guys because I'm thinking of, you make me think so deeply about things. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. For the busy woman out there who want to look polished and put together but don't have time to deal with uncomfortable clothing, meet Beta Brand. Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants are designed with the fit and flexibility of yoga pants, but they look like professional dress pants. I have a couple of styles now. I love their straight leg and their boot cut actually are both super cute. It's pretty much my go-to pants now for when I'm going out. They're just so comfortable, but they also look classy and you can dress them up or down. So I can throw a t-shirt on during the day and run around and do errands. And then I can dress it up at night and wear a nice blouse and a 
leather jacket and they still look incredible. The material is so good that they don't wrinkle. Thank you, Beta Brand. Right now, our listeners can get 30% off their Beta Brand orders when you go to betabrand.com slash Bridget. That's B-E-T-A-B-R-A-N-D dot com slash Bridget. For 30% off your order for a limited time, and when you use our special URL, you're supporting our show too. Find out why women are ditching typical work pants for Beta Brand dress pant yoga pants. Go to betabrand.com slash Bridget for 30% off. One of the chapters of your book that I love, kind of taking this idea of going down to the root, but really in the chapter about adulthood, you have these questions. Am I taking responsibility for my own actions? Am I being closed minded? Am I entrenched in worldview? And if so, why am I coming to conclusions independently? Or have I accepted an ideology that allowed that I allowed to do my thinking for me? Do I avoid collaboration that would be valuable if it would also be challenging? Am I letting emotions make decisions for me, especially hot, intense emotions? Am I ceding my adult responsibilities? And do I make excuses when I do? all are such great questions. Do you think this is, you mentioned the creating an internal reward structure that is independent and ungameable. Is, is it by asking these questions? How does one do that? That's a start. And then having, exposing your own thinking and biases and frailties and strengths, not just to your own, uh, to your own criticism, but to that of others to that of the others in your life whom you trust most, and then spreading it out farther and farther. So, you know, that is that is what scientists are supposed to do, and that is also what humans who are the most anti-fragile and able to do the most in the world with whatever gifts they have do. There are a number of aphorisms. You'll hear them every now and again from from wise people, often from the recent past, about the balance of phrasing the question and trying to answer it. And mm. the wisdom comes in the recognition that the, the bulk of your time ought to be spent on figuring out what the question is, right? Mm. Often answering questions is a much simpler job if you've correctly described them. And so what I would say is, you know, our book, you know, is a, a, an invitation to what we call campfire, which is the way we discuss novel problems. That's where our ancestors have done it. And so we're inviting you to a, a, a novel kind of campfire. But really, what you want to do is not s never focus on symptoms, right? And then think that they are the problem. You want to find the problem and treat the symptoms as symptoms. You don't want to walk into problem solving with a model that is more complex than it needs to be. That will get in your road every step of the way. What you wanna do is minimize the complexity of your toolkit. And, you know, I used to talk when, when we were teaching at Evergreen, I would tell students various paradoxical things at the beginning of, of the term to get them thinking in the right mm -hmm. way. And one of the things that I would say, Heather may have a disagreement about how to say it, but I would say, look, I actually hope that you walk out of this class knowing less than you knew walking in, but I hope that the <laughs> stuff that you know works a lot better. Mm -hmm. Right. The idea is this isn't about knowledge. This is about getting the description of what you are and how it works precise so that you you know how to apply it out in the complexity of life. And so that you can be better at recognizing and interpreting things that come in. Mm -hmm. You can actually assess claims made by others from, again, first principles as much as possible by using your own analytical toolkit rather than saying, well, the guy in the white coat said it, therefore it must be true. Mm -hmm. And when you do this, you end up getting surprised less and less. And when you are surprised, it's more and more useful, right? Mm -hmm. If you're constantly surprised by the world, if you're perplexed by everything, then you're working too hard, right? What you want <laughs> is this, you know, just like with your visual system, right? Your visual system interprets almost everything correctly. And that allows you to walk around your house and not constantly be busting your shins on stuff, right? You don't have to think too hard about it. But every so often something catches your eye and you're like, well, what is that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I get it. That's a shadow of this other thing I had forgotten was over there. So what you want is relatively few surprises. And when they are surprises, you want them to pay off, right? You want them to be worth your time to, to think about them. 
I think the thing that gives me the most hope in your book is the constant insistence um, about how anti fra and the reminder that we're anti fragile. I found that I, I just the persistence of our our humanity always baffles me under <laughs> conditions that one of my friends is a Holocaust survivor, and it just is mind boggling to me what humans can endure and and overcome and still go on and be productive members of society and have loving families. And, and that is, that gives me an immense amount of hope. Although there is that the tendency, like you mentioned in the book about childhood in the chapter about childhood and education too, of just making everyone feel safe and people aren't really pushing themselves outside of their comfort zone. And yeah. I'm not sure. And I, I feel like that through the pandemic that has the kind of risk aversion has has really accelerated. Absolutely. And unfortunately, one thing that seems to be true of our anti-fragility is that if we treat ourselves as if we're fragile, we actually become fragile. Mm. We lose the anti-fragility, which seems like a contradiction in terms. But there really is a risk. And you know, it is reversible. It's less easy to reverse and maybe less fully reversible the older we are, the longer we persist in certain trends. But even if you arrive at 18, having been protected from everything by your parents and your school, and you therefore have the body of an adult, but the mind of a child, and you don't know how to navigate risk or problem solve or anything, you, you still can. You still can learn that. But it's not going to be as much fun as it would have been if you were seven and learning right. how to jump off of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's fun when you're little. It feels good. And yes, the adults in your sphere are going to go, wait, don't, that's too risky, right? And sometimes it will be too risky and sometimes it won't. And sometimes you'll get a little hurt and hopefully you won't get a lot hurt. Mm -hmm. That gets less fun and more difficult the older you are, but it is absolutely necessary to do. Yeah. I think about all the times climbing that tree. Just the, I think about all the times I've pushed myself into risky situations, traveling alone around the world in many cases, doing things that I can't tell you how many times I was like, thank God, if my father could see me right now, he'd have a heart attack. <laughs> when I was in India, he did get a bleeding ulcer and my siblings were like, come home. <laughs> you're, you're, you're killing dad. Um, <laughs> but there... But they were experiences that were like National Geographic. I would never. We went fishing in Sri Lanka with local fishermen with, by the old way that they do it with the nets and jumped in the Indian Ocean to splash to get the fish to scare them into the I, And it was my top five experiences in my life. And had I stood on that beach and been afraid... I never would have been able to experience any of that. And yes, it was definitely risky. Those boats were janky. But <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad I did it and just traveling, I think. You mentioned so much just about traveling in other countries and I I feel like that is one of the easiest ways to get in touch with yourself. Find out where you're afraid and who you are and and challenge your perceptions is to put yourself in another country. Absolutely. No, it's, a, it's an extraordinary education. And it just reveals so much about all of your assumptions. Yeah, you, you not only learn how many other ways there are to be human, mm -hmm. and how many other that includes you know, everything from food to culture to music, you know, to everything, right. But you also learn a tremendous amount about your home culture and yourself and mm -hmm. where your fears are. And I would say that, you know, as much as, and you were just saying this, but as much as it's possible, banishing your fear, not banishing your caution, not being reckless, but walking around with as little fear as possible, as much understanding, but as little fear will allow you to, to see things more wisely and accurately. Yeah. You, when you're experiencing fear, you want it to be about something, mm. you know, and, and, you know, in many cases, really the way to think of it is, if you're avoiding risk, you're making an error. The thing mm. to do is to manage risk, right? You want to have some part of you aware as your risk is going up and know where the threshold is. Wait, this is too much risk, right? Mm -hmm. This is this is now a gamble, right? This mm -hmm. is a gamble I can't afford to have go wrong, right? At that point you want to back off. But yeah. and 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 choose your risk wisely. 
You know, we're, we're part of the message of the book is that we are all being exposed to modern risks due to the hyper novelty of our situation that we are doing without our choosing and that we're right. getting almost no benefit from. You know, who's who's benefiting is, you know, the, the market forces and other people who would have our decisions made for us in order to keep us, you know, docile and fat and not particularly healthy and <laughs> screen bound and, you know, all of these things. And that, you know, that is a apt description of of a lot of us and we all know that we are our better selves when we are less docile and more active and less screen bound and interacting with real people and outside and moving our bodies and it can be hard to motivate but part part of the lesson too is how to find your internal motivation by creating enough of these experiences that feel amazing that you're seeking those you're seeking the long term the you know the, the long haul benefit of of serendipity and exploration rather than actually it's easier to sit on the couch with my hand in a bag of cheetos mm, i loved that quote in your book i wrote it down movement increases wisdom mm -hmm. it was just something that i i there's a great, um, at the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, there's the little, what are the little things that you walk in, the walking meditations? Oh my gosh. I always... Hamster wheel? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're like, they can be the gardens and you can walk. I always forget the name of them because I don't know why, but they have in Latin, it says it is solved by walking. Yeah, I recognize I what you're talking that. about. I will remember it after we're off here. Of course. Yeah, there's so much. That is really this, you know, as someone who's, in recovery, my husband's in recovery. And so we obsessively talk about this. It's the, uh, our pretty much primary conversation is, is, and he works in the recovery field and it's uh, how do you motivate yourself to do, you know, all of recovery is kind of the long-term benefits for in many instances. And I don't know how to, it's, I guess it's different for every person, but how do you find that thing? How does that individual find that thing to motivate them to, to those little tiny wins that you can stack? Maybe it's just changing. I think you mentioned this in your book, just change one thing, just one thing. Start with changing one thing and see how you feel. I love that you um, address medication. I think I worked with children and and they were all in like these private schools and seeing how many medications they were on in their teens was just crazy to me. And these kids were just bored. I mean, right. they were they were really just bored and they were just basically medicating them so that they would be complacent. And instead of figuring out how to stimulate the children, they just were giving them all prescriptions or they wanted attention from their parents who were wealthy and passing them off to nannies or whatnot. There were other things at work that seemed to be influencing why these children needed to be medicated that had nothing to do with their personality or their their mood disorder or whatever they were diagnosed with at twelve, or their aptitude, or right. their, you know their capacity in any way. But you know, every everyone actually wants a challenge, and I th we have forgotten that. Moderns mm. have too often forgotten that. We think what we want is comfort and safety and ease. And comfort and safety and ease feel good. And there are certainly moments you know, we, we all would like and deserve to have a home base that allows that to which we know we can return. Mm -hmm. But the idea that challenge is the thing that needs to be eradicated, well, then you have a lot of people who have no sense of meaning. Mm -hmm. Because it is, the, it is the rare child who knows what they're driven to do, right? right. Some, some children do. Um, and some of those children who do change their minds later, and that's also totally fine. But largely, you figure out what it is that you're amazing at and what you want to do in the world by exposing yourself to lots of different things which are difficult. And I mean, actually, this, this allows me to come back to something I wanted to say when we were talking about walking. You know, okay, so 20 minutes a day of walking is considered active, which sounds crazy, but it's also... And, but it's also not enough. Even that little bit, of course, is not enough, but we also need to physically challenge ourselves, like push ourselves to some limit occasionally, not every day, not right. at all, occasionally, so as to send the message to, in that case, our bodies, you know, our muscles and our bones, you may sometimes be expected to do this, therefore, ante up. Like, you yep. need to be able to do this. Same thing with the mental stuff. You need to challenge yourself so that it 
hurts. Mm -hmm. So that maybe sometimes you fail, you don't get there, you don't solve the math problem or write the poem or, or heal the person, whatever it is. And that gives you a sense of actually, sometimes I will be called upon to do this. So next time I'm going to be better prepared. Uh, there's so much in your book that it's just so, it's so necessary. I just, I hope that people can figure out how to implement it in their lives. I think that it's like, I, you can read a book like this and go, yep, I know exactly that's what I need to do. I need to get the technology out of my bedroom and I need to wake up and go for a walk. And, and that doesn't matter. I mean, there's, there's the great mantra or whatever saying that we have in recovery, which is, you can't think your way into di acting differently, but you can act your way into thinking differently. So it's just, if you just take the action every day, eventually, like you said, you'll create those conditions that you're more invested in the long-term rewards and the work. But I also wonder too, just how I think a lot about doom scrolling and how you're saying, you know, fear needs to be, you really need to be afraid of something. You should be. And I read this article and I wish I had saved it, but it was all about how outrage was usually something that was to propel us to motion. But because now we have all these couch outrage activists and couch, we're getting outrage just sitting in front of a screen. It's actually changing the way outrage, they're finding it's changing the way outrage is actually experienced by humans, the original purpose. And this is like the thing of... um doom scrolling where you're feeling all this fear while you sc scroll and scroll and scroll, but it's not real fear. I always talk, I was talking about this just the other day and I've mentioned it before. You'll look outside and it will be a beautiful day and the birds are chirping and you're in, in the box of fear. Yeah. We have, uh, this phenomenon now of, uh, couch tornadoes. Ooh, what's that? I don't know. It's the al alternative to couch potatoes, I think. <laughs> 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 All right, maybe like it didn't that. work as well as I was outrage hoping. Brought home, yeah, outrage, right, exactly. <laughs> <Couch> Passive <laughs> <I> outrage. Like <laughs> it is though. It is like a little tornado that you just fall down. But I do wonder what it does when you're actually experiencing fear. Is it real fear that you're feeling, or is it like a a simile of fear, or some kind of uh, a shadow of fear? Well, there is some of us have discovered under circumstances that are not ideal, that actually <laughs> frightening situations bring clarity. Right. For other people, they bring paralysis. And it's really important to know whether you're going to be paralyzed by fear. And if you are, it's really something to address because the last thing you want to do is discover that when the chips are down, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, for those who do find fear paralytic, exposing yourself to enough risk that you get used to that idea and you can calm your mind and figure out what to do and get out of the situation is crucial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know. I, it seems like there were a lot of near-death experiences that were al alluded to in the book, although I do want to hear the boat story someday. Or Where, where did you discuss it? I didn't even... It's Oh, I, I put it on, on Medium. I'll, okay. I'll make it more I'll widely available. It. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I need to read this story. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Are you looking for an easier way to onboard and manage remote employees? JustWorks makes it easier for you to start, run, and grow a business. Let me tell you how JustWorks can help your business. With JustWorks, employees can onboard themselves in minutes with simple software that makes a great first impression. You can give them access to national large group health insurance plans and handle payroll and PTO requests all on one platform. Plus, it comes with JustWorks expert 24-7 support for you and your team. JustWorks makes it simple to hire and manage remote employees across all 50 states. I know there are a lot of entrepreneurs who listen to our podcast, and as one myself, I know there are a lot of different aspects of the business that I need to take care of that I have no idea how to take care of. And JustWorks makes that so much easier and streamlines all of this for the entrepreneur. Things like payroll, HR, and compliance can be pretty confusing. It can get very complex, and JustWorks makes it easier for you to start, run, and grow a business. Find out how JustWorks can help your business by going to JustWorks.com. That's JustWorks.com for more info. I know you have to go. There are two questions that 
came from my community that I thought were great. And one of them is if you could bring back any species, because there was this discussion of the woolly mammoth and Tony Robbins wants to bring back the woolly mammoth. And I was like, tax the rich. They have too much money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you could bring back one species, what would it be? That's a really good question. I know. I loved it. Uh, it for me, it might be a pterosaur. Interesting. Mm. You know, there's just, we lost an entire clade of flying vertebrates. And uh, wouldn't it be wonderful to have them in the skies again? <laughs> of course, it's the kind of thing a person, or maybe I'd bring back a medium sized one rather than the really gigantic one. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, we're both, so we both. The only thing I came up with was one of the saber-toothed cats, either the no. American or the Australian version, and they're convergent. They're both amazing, but they're terrifying. So we both came <laughs> up with these like terrifying organisms. They're charismatic megafauna, and you know, off air after we're you know hours after we're done talking with Bridget, we'll probably come up with the right answer. But wait, wait, wait! I've like got a couple insects. candidates. Okay, okay. I've got a couple candidates. Um, <laughs> one of them. The atmosphere wouldn't support it anymore, but uh, giant dragonflies. Oh, giant yeah. I think we can all get behind that one. Oh, right? I can get yeah. behind that. Totally. Right. Yeah. And then the other one would be the elephant bird. Oh. The Malagasy elephant bird. This is a bird that went extinct so recently that their eggshells are still strewn around their rookery. And if you're in Madagascar, people will collect the eggshells and they'll sort of mock up a uh, an AP or in a shell. They're oh, even wow. they're they're bigger than ostriches. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, giant flightless bird of that same clade, the paleognaths, I, I think. Yeah, but yeah, you you we never did, but uh, in modern times, the shells are still findable. Yep. Yeah. So we killed them right off. <laughs> well, I didn't. But. No, it wasn't us. No, personally. <laughs> when you guys were in Madagascar, you finished them off. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, hunger is very motivating. Exactly. We started having omelets, and we just couldn't stop. <laughs> That was another thing. There's so many things. I really could go rogue in length with you guys. There, There's so many things in the book you talk about. If you've never really been hungry, that that was a great... We didn't really address even just the part about how culture and consciousness, which I think is fascinating and deserves its own podcast, really. The other question, though, that... And we didn't even really talk about gender and, and also um, relationships, but someone in my community said they heard you talking about marriage and how it's a good thing and but they were wondering how do you find a good partner because i know you say d stay away from dating apps so what is your advice for people if not dating apps how how to go about finding a good partner well i would say um my advice on this is liable to be a lot better than heather's just <laughs> empirically speaking <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible thing to say. Um, no, but I mean, the, the, the problem in this case is um, that we have been together for a long time. And so, right. you know, neither of us has dated in the modern environment. And um, Brett has actually come out swinging much harder for dating apps against dating apps against than dating apps, yeah. I have because my sense is um, I know that m so many of the places where people used to meet and gather things, things like churches, which you know, churches or synagogues, which you know, never was part of Brett's or my milieu, but other social gathering places have become so much less popular, and so you know, and and you know, work has become an impossible place to do anything uh, in the modern environment, um, romantically. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm, I'm not sure. It's not clear to me that dating apps can be off the table for people. And not knowing much about what, how they operate, I don't know how best, how best to use them. I well, know a lot of people who have met and got married on dating apps, but the, we don't have enough of the long-term data to see if those relationships hold up. Yeah, just wait for the emergence of the divorce apps. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so th I mean, there are there are a couple things to say. One, I think there's a lesson. You know, we did get together very early, which uh, at the time I thought, you know. You marry the right, you marry the person at the point you meet him, and we probably met too early. I don't feel this way at all now because I will say, however, that we you know we we had been with other people and we got together, and then it was still eight years before we got married. So yeah, we okay. didn't. Yeah, we just want to make sure we were on the right track. <laughs> yeah. there, there, was a, there was a lot that happened in there, right? <laughs> but but one of the secret, you know, secrets of the universe that I think we discovered was that you're not really looking for the one the way right. the mythology has it. You're looking for somebody that is 
compatible and complementary who has the toolkit to grow with you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Heather and I have now seen so much of life together right. that we are intertwined in a way that I wouldn't trade for anything. So mm -hmm. um, not looking for the one, but looking for somebody that's got the ma building materials to be the one at the point that you've, you know, faced the world together is a big one. The other thing I would say is that the sophistications of the moment are extremely destructive and that people who figure that out and just simply say, look, I'm going to opt out of that, right? A community of people that opts out of that together and says, look, I'm interested in dating and I'm interested in looking for that person, but I want to search among other people who figured out that the, um, you know, the stuff that you're supposed to be doing isn't necessarily good for you. In fact, it's almost certainly the inverse. Uh, that community is liable to be a big upgrade in your dating life. It's going to be a much smaller community, but those people who figured out early, hey, this isn't working, right? We need mm -hmm. to do something else. We need to agree to some set of rules about how we're going to treat each other, <laughs> right? Those people are liable to be higher quality people. You know, we need a dating app for that. <laughs> oh, you, you do, or you need a segment, a badge, or something. I mean, I, the movement needs a name, I guess. But no, I, I mean, I, I think from what I've heard you talk about um, your locals community, Bridget. I mean, I think you know there there are ways to do this. Waiting there are, for that marriage within the community. <laughs> well, you you've clearly got a trusting interesting, engaged group of people who, yeah, they came there because of you, but now they're there for their own reasons of creating community in a place that feels honorable and fun, I yeah. imagine. Like I'm, you know, I'm making all this up, but I think- someone there recently it is. that I never, yeah. we never met. This is a person who is just super engaged in our community and it affected so many people when he passed away and we had a Zoom memorial. I mean, I'll get emotional talking about it, just- that community, the way that it has create, you know, you you create the space for it, but the way that they've taken it becomes something else. Like it takes on a life of its own. And I will say, my cousin Maggie, she she says, I think that just my addition to the answer of where do you meet a good partner, I think this is an opportunity to also take risks. It's an opportunity mm. to join, like one of those sports clubs that they have for adults in your city or yeah. some kind of club where I, I'm lucky I met my husband at, in recovery. So we had that shared, we have shared values and we have that language that we both speak and a framework that we can kind of deal with one another in the world. And that happens all the time in recovery. It's like yeah. one of the, you hear it. And so there's, yeah, go to a church maybe if you're somebody who went to church and haven't been going or try that bocce club that you always wanted to try. Yeah, sports or dance or yep. music, you know, samba. You know, th it feels like there are actually a number of places that are potentials. Bocce, mm -hmm. hibachi for people who like barbecue, Fibonacci <laughs> for mathematicians. There are a lot of things you could do just to find your people. You are a wealth of information. <laughs> you really well, thank are. you. You both are. Except that you were probably being sarcastic. <laughs> I love you both so much. I hope everyone gets your book. You're welcome back anytime. There's still so much that I could talk about about your book that it really just got me thinking. And one of our community things we're doing later in Locals is we're all, I'm doing my quarterly goals. I kind of always, I'm very transparent about my body, mind, and spirit goals. And then also just like business goals, but more importantly, the other ones. And I wrote all these things down. Some of them were like technology out of the bedroom. And I just have to really hold myself accountable because it really, it does affect the quality of my sleep and that affects everything. And diet is, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I crave good food. I was like the drunk that craved salads. <laughs> yeah. or organic Cheetos are not enough. <laughs> they Sweet. were not enough for me. So where can we find you for anyone who might not know? Well, let me say first, we love you too, Bridget. And we <laughs> really you. appreciate yes, talking indeed. to you. We, well, the book is A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. And what was the place you suggested that sources from independent bookstores? Um, Bookshop.org. Book Bookshop.org. That sounds great. I would um, also point out, I did not realize that local bookstore is actually a physical thing, but I ran into one the other day. People <laughs> could also go to a local bookstore and apparently they, many of them have copies of the book.
Some of them do. Some of them are sold out already. I, I, I was actually in one, as you well know, a couple of days ago looking at our book on the shelf. Um, but uh, let's see, where else? I guess um, yeah, we, both, we both have websites, heatherhying.com, brettweinstein.net. Dot net. net. And we're on Twitter, for better and for worse. Well, uh, <laughs> Heather E. Hying and, and Brett Weinstein. the Dark Horse Podcast. Oh, of course. And my the goodness. Dark Horse That's the Podcast. Place. Dark Horse Podcast. Right. The Dark yeah. Horse Podcast, of yes, course. Yes, of course. The, hence the dark horse. Hence the dark you. horse. Exactly. Well, I look forward to our next conversation. I'm sure uh, there were so many questions from my community too that were really great questions and I just don't have time for them. But um, I definitely later on would love to talk about at some point in the future. One of the questions was unity and, you know, what do you think for 2024? And I think that could be a whole podcast because I am interested in, you know, the fourth Frontier. 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 Yeah. Yep. How how I can help. <laughs> I, I don't know what I can do, but I I can I definitely want to help people stand up for what they love and what they're for and even if I can embolden them in any way and help help with that. Just let me know. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you again. You. Thank you so much. See you next time. Walk ins welcome is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? A smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about. Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company & Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed in 2020. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. My whole life is just television now. Her whole world has shrunk down. <laughs> I consider it watching. research for our own it script writing. It does make me want to write scripts uh -huh. watching Breaking Bad. I've been joking that I discovered this little unknown <laughs> show called Breaking Bad. <laughs> and I'm so mad that I didn't watch it like in real time with everyone. Uh -huh. Because I remember everyone freaking out the last season as like the final, you know, I think three or four episodes are just nuts. And I think particularly episode 14 of season five is one of the greatest episodes of television I've ever seen in my life. Wow. You're making me want to watch it. I've never watched the show. Well, I've watched the first few episodes and then I was just, I was getting too stressed out. It's not yeah. a show that you can watch by yourself or at least I was struggling with it. Mm. So it's, I feel like it's pretty it's, dark. It's easier to like watch with someone to be like, to be able to talk about it and to be able to like, you know, make a joke to take the tension off of some sort of intense moment. But, I think that's why I wish I watched it in real time too mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. like the, the community of people in the world who yeah. are watching it to have that relief. It was like the same with game of Thrones where you had those like heavy episodes, but you could, you know, collectively process it. Right. So there's no collective processing going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And I started watching it in 2013 when it started, except I was getting sober and right. it's too triggering. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, if, there are so many scenes that I've been in, in that, situation or it's just weird we I like jaron and i can't even watch certain scenes where we're like oh god this gives us anxiety yeah because we've been there uh -huh. and these like house parties or these like grungy kind of i don't know just situations where you're you shouldn't be really ever uh-huh and just the like open drug use like always jaron couldn't watch it because he was offended that they weren't like smoking meth the right way. Oh. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I think you got to get those details right, though, in a show. No, that's... you do. And I feel like they do later on because I think they got called on it. But early in the pilot, he was like, this is bullshit. No one smokes meth like this. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I can see how that would be offensive. Whereas someone like me would have no freaking idea if yeah. they were doing it right or not. <laughs> well, and they seem to have like all of the details of like, cooking meth and uh-huh. you know they have a vast amount of knowledge on this topic so you would think that that would be one of the things they they got right yeah <laughs> yeah jaren's like i can't watch this show well i just finished watching the hulu series on 9-11 and oh. It's uplifting content yeah, like I breaking know. bad usually it's it's i surprised myself with it because usually i just kind of stay away from like super heavy stuff like that but i don't know i was just felt like i needed to watch it and i'm also probably going to watch the the series on netflix just the 20th anniversary and i don't it was so good i knew i would like cry and yeah. um i think i watched like two episodes a night that was my like limit but it's only six episodes and oh. It was just like I there were certainly moments where I was like bawling, like weeping, but it's so you just it seemed important for me to watch. I I, I, I can't explain it better than that, like of just remembering this because you're watching the first like episode and it's like, you know what happens? It's <laughs> like, but you watch the firefighters respond like it's all this video, yeah. like a uh, uh, from people uh, reacting on the day. Yeah, yeah. My sister saw it. And and you so it's like you know he's like you, the the fire chief brigade guy was like i knew i was going to the biggest fire of my life and i would be in charge when i got there like i would initially i would be in command and and you're sitting there being like it gets so much worse it gets so much worse and it's just like this whole thing but it's just so i don't know it's so powerful they did a really good job and it just reminded me of like the collective unity of people there were just so many stories of like people helping each other and yeah. being kind to each other and then just watching people reacting to it and like people on the street crying. And I'm like, it's such a just, it shows you human empathy in a way that we don't see very often. And in a way that like you just, people were reacting to something horrible happening and, and thinking about the people in that building and like crying for them, you yeah. know, like that's just a, a very human response it just kind of like puts us in touch with our humanity our collective like empathy and shared like reactions and stuff like that so it it was just really powerful and i don't know it it reminded me of a time when like the response to that tragedy was such a kind of like coming together of the country and we're so far apart now and we're yeah. so like f we don't see the humanity in the other side and we don't see it's just terrible that tragedies like that are what unite us yeah but also the internet did not exist in the capacity that it does now it's true. and i'm not entirely convinced that it wouldn't have been like immediately divisive after the original soft Heart, you know, coming together of like a couple of days, right? Because the nature of these platforms is to create this us versus them mentality. That's true, or at least accentuate that which already exists in our tribal DNA. Yeah, it's such a weird thing to to look back on and remember, and and have it be like one of the women who you know, kind of was rescued from the building or came out of the building like right before it collapsed. And it, towards the end, they had been like, you know, how do you feel about what happened? And she was like, well, and, and they were like, you know, like when the plane being hijacked and she was like hijacked, she had no idea, yeah. you know, she, and they were like, yes, this was a terrorist attack. And she was like, in America? Yeah. And I was just like, oh, yeah, that was unprecedented in a way. Like it's just not something we thought about really i just remember not being able to comprehend what was happening you know it was like i could not and my sister and i have it on video right are reacting to it which i never want to see but we have it because we were videotaping everything at that time and it and i just remember like everyone i think just was on the couch for like a week yeah just in shock like yeah. collectively in shock I, re I remember just not being able, I could not believe I was seeing those towers fall. I remember the first time we went to New York after 
many, many times of being in New York and just the like entire skyline being that drastically altered. It was. Yeah. I'll never forget taking the train into New York that first time, that November right after and seeing the skyline. It was still smoky. Yeah. It was like still smelled like plastic. I I didn't realize I too I think how quickly it happened or I'd forgotten how yeah. like the first I mean the South Tower collapsed like an hour after it was hit. It was, it was nuts. so fast. Yeah. I thought it was like a couple hours at least and then the North Tower collapsed like a half hour after the I South know. one. It was just and the fact that those fucking buildings came down I is know. still astonishing. I mean I understand why people like don't believe that it just could have happened that way. Uh-huh. Uh, I get it because there's it seems so impossible. You're yeah. like, what? This can't be real. I know. This is like something that if you saw in a movie, you'd be like, yeah, right. Oh, the towers fell down. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Like, what are the chances of both of them being hit perfectly that they both come down straight, straight down? Uh-huh. Like, it's it just seemed statistically impossible. Uh-huh. But then I watched something, I, I don't know, like, I can't remember when I watched it. It was a long time ago. It was like after 9-11 pretty recently. And they were doing this like structural analysis of why the tower, like the way they were designed mm-hmm. and how the collapse happened. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not an engineer. Ex- explains, I'm sure that an explains engineer it. could be like, I'll tell you exactly <laughs> this why this happened. They were like a unique design that like it was, it was interesting. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess that explains it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it did look like like a demolition. Uh, <laughs> I always joke about that. Like, uh, if you're down that rabbit hole and you're in like the 9-11 was an inside job, you're like, you've, you've gone too far. <laughs> All roads lead to 9-11 was an inside job on, online. On YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, and I didn't realize too, I, for some reason I thought more people had been like pulled out of the rubble than actually did survive. I, I don't know why I thought that, but I thought they were finding survivors for days, but it really I don't wasn't. Think so. No, it was like, no. No. Not true. They were all like vaporized. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I don't think. Yeah, they had a bad job, those was, guys. Ugh. That's the one reason I still love John Stewart because he freaking fought for those guys. I know, really, truly, like made it happen for yeah. them. Yeah, well, like too little, like long after they deserved it. And this is when I'm like, our government is such a bullshit. I don't know how anyone can trust the government at all. Uh huh. Like between what we do to our vets and what happened to the guys who were at ground zero, like sorting through the fucking rubble for months and all got cancer. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, Jesus Christ. (sighs) Such a fucking... Well, this... This conversation took a sharp turn. I'm sorry. No, it didn't. We started talking about Breaking Bad. (laughs) Like the darkest show ever. (laughs) Breaking Bad makes me anxious because of all the lying. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. It's just like that level of double life uh-huh. and lie. It was the same reason Dexter made me anxious when someone's that much of a sociopath that they can just keep lying and lying and lying and justifying it to themselves and lying to themselves, really. I mean, more than anything, I think he lies to himself that he's like doing this for his family. Yeah. And it's like more and more apparent throughout all of the seasons that it's not that at all. Yeah, interesting. It's okay. so good. I do have to watch. It's I like. So I really. Good. It's one of those shows. Like I know I'll watch it. I really do want to watch it, but I can't watch it by myself. And Bob Odenkirk is truly like a national treasure <laughs> <laughs> who needs to be protected at all costs. <laughs> he's so. He's such a. What a brilliant comic relief that that show desperately needed that they bring into the show and you're like oh thank god every Mm -hmm. time he's on screen you know you're gonna get like a lot of relief Uh from the the heaviness yeah yep i like it though i've i've been putting it off watching it and now i'm just in awe of like the story structure and the guy who created it was on x files for like 18 years as a writer Mm. And the reason that they ended it at five seasons at the height of the popularity and it was like never a bigger phenomenon was because he felt like X-Files wore out its welcome, which mm-hmm. it did. Mm-hmm. 
and just became a show that kept making sh- episodes for the sake of the fact that it kept getting renewed instead of right the story their, yeah the yeah. story being a uh, committed to the story and yeah i think five seasons for something like that is really perfect it's a really good arc and i just feel like yes i understand all the decisions going behind like oh we have a hit show like keep it longer but if you can do something like that like this will it's a it's like a masterpiece that will live forever it's like calvin and Hobbes. it's like a a perfectly very few, few things are perfectly executed in that way I know. I look at like Game of Thrones and I'm like, God, oh, you guys wow, botched they it. Shut the bed. Yeah. Just It was truly. so good too. There were some episodes that were just so so beautiful. Iconic. Yeah. And then it just crapped the giant cock took a cock eye in the bed. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to listen to Bridget's My Spinoff series where we just analyze TV shows, <laughs> <laughs> let us know. Maybe that's something we'll start doing. <laughs> I consider it all research, truly. <laughs> it is. And I have to say, Breaking Bad is one of the few shows where it will end like a season on a cliffhanger where I'm like, I did not even see that coming. Wow. That's impressive. Like, it's really Holy hard to do. Shit. Like the end of season four ends with one shot where I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I did not. I don't know why I didn't see it coming. Uh-huh. And then I went back to the episode where it gives away like it gives you a clue. Uh-huh. I was like, oh, they're so fucking good. Like every single thing pays off. I love that when something is really well done like that. It's just truly it makes you appreciate the brilliance. And they do things like what we were doing in our pilot for the they take the time with the characters to to show their like quirky little things or I don't know. I appreciate the way the way they treat the characters too, Mm. even if they are people who are inevitably going to die very soon. Right. They still give you a window into them as a person. That's important, I think, because you never know a character is about to die and and you have to like cre- treat them like a, a fully fleshed human being to be like this person this is their a person with its own their own life and their own, you know, plans and their own, you know, vision for their life and whether or not you know they're going to die, they don't know they're going to die. So well organized. Season two, I guess they had planned from beginning to end, like Mm. every episode. Mm. And you can tell it's so well done. And they do really amazing things with the cold opens. Mm -hmm. The like, for people who don't know what the cold open is, it's that little clip that happens before the intro, like title piece that we all get to skip now, thank God. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they do really cool stuff with that. And they also use... Instead of flashing back, they do a cool thing where they'll flash forward and then they'll move forward into that time. Interesting. So they'll use the cold open to like flash forward in time and uh-huh. then they'll take a whole season to, to get to, to like, that moment. yeah, what happened in that moment. That's cool. Well, I mean, the, the cold open for the pilot became so iconic that so many people tried to copy it that now they're like, don't do this anymore. <laughs> for which one? For Breaking Bad. Oh... Uh... Well, yeah, that was a hell of a cold open. Yeah, and so many people like tried to recreate it or copy it or do their own version of it in some way that it wore out. It's like welcome. It was, but it was very, very iconic. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they were brilliant. With, they're brilliant with the cold opens. Mm. They're so interesting. And sometimes they'll use them to give backstory. They just use them so effectively. It was not a waste. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, just I love so a good, good cold open. There's nothing better. I love them too. I'm a huge cold open fan. Me too, yeah. And I think if you can use them like that, the way they do, kind of artistically. But also like telling, moving your story forward in some way. Yeah. Like not just being a waste. Or hinting at a story that you're moving towards. Right. So good. The show is so good. I could like study it for the rest of my life. Maggie's like, I'm sure there are entire channels devoted to doing it on YouTube. (laughs) Yes. Richard falls down another rabbit hole. You're making me want to watch it, though. So maybe it's, I will. It's, you know why it's so impressive? Because it's one of the very few shows that just gets somehow better every season. Yeah, that's incredibly difficult. There's no fat on it at all. Mm-hmm. There's some episodes that might drag a little more or whatever, but 
every character it's like the classic you know you see movement in the characters there's like change and it's just so good it's so good it really i get it i get why people say breaking bad is the greatest show ever made on television mm. because i have not seen anything so well done and i just watched a bunch of shows too that were crap like started strong and then just Crapped were out. crap yeah yeah, yeah. Because you don't, they don't, even if their choices are stupid or you're like, why are you doing this and Breaking Bad? They're absolutely a choice the character would make. Right. Even right. if it's something where you're like, this is so dumb, you're an idiot. You're like, but you would totally fucking do this because you're egotistical or megalomaniac or you actually are an idiot. Right. They stay true to the character in that way. That's, yeah. That's important. I respect that. And they don't, they, they don't take their audience for granted. Mm-hmm. They don't dumb it down. No. Yeah. They make you kind of keep up. So good. Anyway, this has been your, <laughs> this has been your Breaking Bad Stan <laughs> your episode. Weekly TV review. <laughs> <laughs> That's what these are going to become. <laughs> seriously. Fine, apparently. as long as it gets me out of the culture wars. <laughs> I don't care. I seriously think it's part of my addictive personality too because I've just been escaping. Uh huh. I don't want to go online. I don't want anything to do with the culture war. I want to just turn away. No, television is my drug of choice. Like that is <laughs> that is my addiction. Yeah, I think it's become mine. We should get this sponsored by a television show. <laughs> Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>